you are listening to Castles and Cryptids, where the castles are haunted and the cryptids are cryptic as fuck. I am Alana. <laughs> and I'm Kelsey. <laughs> and today is episode 35. Yeah. It is. And I actually knew that for once. <laughs> as you just reminded me. And we're yeah. like, which one's coming out and which one are we recording now? Yeah. Awesome. But you know what? We're doing it. And, like, unfortunately, I feel bad because some podcasts that really try can't find the time to record stuff. And I'm like, it doesn't matter if it's disjointed. Yeah. (laughs) As long as we get it done. (laughs) (laughs) (sighs) Um, Yeah, we're we're, we're at least a week ahead for you. So don't worry. We're we're fine. We're fine with that, right? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Um... And for this episode, this lovely episode 35, because it's coming out on November 19th, it's a couple days after my brother's birthday, so I would like to put this episode out or give a shout out to my bro, Daniel. (laughs) Yeah. Happy birthday. Yeah. Happy birthday. And yeah, my case is a little bit inspired, we'll say, by some stuff he likes, so. Oh, okay. I was going to say, does somebody named yeah. Daniel get murdered? <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> well, no. Okay, good. <laughs> oh, no, I know. We do true crime. So I guess that's where I was like, what, where is your mind going to go? No, it's more of the theme. I decided to do Yakuza crimes. Ooh. Have you heard of the Yakuza? Yeah, they're like the mob or like a gang, I guess. Yeah, that's that's what I think. Yeah. <laughs> After all my extensive research, I can concur. They are a gang. They're the mob in Italy. Or in <laughs> Italy. Oh. <laughs> Japan? Help me, please. Help me. <laughs> the, the equivalent of the Italian mob in Japan, I think, is what I was going for there. Yeah. Um... <laughs> um yeah, I think that was my shout out. I wonder if there was anything else I was going to say before we dive into it because clearly I'm firing on all cylinders. <laughs> um we just released the Cryptids by Air episode. Oh, um there was not like a mini correction because um we had talked about thinking there was an episode of drinking the kool-aid which there was that talked about your case on the killer couples with the binions i remember afterwards i was like i still don't remember but that i figured it was just my horrible memory because that would totally make sense and i listened to a million podcasts lately but it it was on a different it ended up being on a different drinking the kool-aid podcast yeah (laughs) which i was like what how is there one that's just spelled like slightly differently like cool with a c <laughs> yeah instead of cool like the kool-aid my kool-aid drink right which they spell yes that's right the one that i like with cassidy and amanda they spell it like correctly yeah. although fun fact the kool-aid that they talk of of drinking the kool-aid with the jim jones suicide it was actually flavor aid did you know that <laughs> i think I had heard that before. I mean, I think it's just, yeah, it's just kind of a fun fact. Just a, kind of a cheap, a cheap Kool-Aid. <laughs> yeah, Bailey Sarian on YouTube, she did like a whole really long, like hour-long deep dive into Jim, Jim Jones. And there was a lot of like his upbringing and everything. And 90% of the episodes you're going... If this guy had used, like, his power for good, he could have done so much good. Because, oh, man, like, some of the stuff he had plans for was, like, amazing. And stuff he was trying to do in, like, small communities for people that were less fortunate. And then he just got caught up in the power and the drugs and (laughs) crazy and paranoid. and Right. Obviously, cult leaders have to have charisma. Yeah. And they... And clearly he had some ideologies, yeah, yeah. B- utopias in mind, yeah. Yeah. Sounds all well and good. <laughs> yeah, but even when he was, like, working for, like, local churches and stuff, 
he was doing like really good people loved him like, yeah yeah it was kind of crazy <sighs> how people like that can like devolve into such like a crazy type of situation that's true also we should do cults yeah definitely. writing it down <laughs> <laughs> no but i was thinking about that because i was listening to things earlier where i'm like ooh, like black eyed kids and cults and we need to do some more like creepy people episodes <laughs> yeah that's the problem i want to do them all <laughs> talk about everything <laughs> I want it all. I want it now, Daddy. I want a squirrel. <laughs> Veruca Salt. <laughs> she wants the whole world. Give okay. Me the golden ticket. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a blueberry. <laughs> <The golden ticket. laughs> oh my god. Alright, was there anything we needed to talk about <laughs> before I dive in? I don't think so. I don't so. think so. I don't think we got to it. The cryptids episode listen to it i hope you enjoyed our next one um which we sometimes just mention at the end very quickly but <laughs> i'm excited about the next one it's gonna be like scary ships I, and i say that and it sounds stupid but like <laughs> ghost ships you know spooky ships yeah so i don't know what you're doing that's why i'm just still calling it scary ships in my head so i don't yeah, I haven't even started to look at it. I know nothing no, about any neither. haunted ships than what BuzzFeed Unsolved has told me. Haunted just... ones, yeah. Well, yeah, you definitely got, like, your, there's very famous haunted ones that still are around, like, Queen Mary and stuff. Yeah. And then, like, you get the ones that, like, ghost ships that, like, nope, they found out at sea with nobody on them. But, oh, Ooh. yeah, I don't know. I, there's a lot. There's a lot to choose from there. <laughs> Yeah. I think that one's going to be a fun one. But I always have fun with the paranormal ones. But this one was a fun one, too. <laughs> and by fun, I mean I liked learning about the gangsters. <laughs> yeah, it's cool. I don't think we've really... Well, maybe in we talked about like a mob kind of situation when I was talking about the Gardner Museum and like some of the possible people that may have robbed it but other than that i don't think we've really talked about mob or like mafia or gangs or anything ah uh, mario and luigi with their mustaches yeah. <laughs> yeah they had there was a lot of mustaches going on in that episode there was, and they were all it, supposedly <laughs> fake <laughs> it's a great thing <laughs> and they said they were cheap and terrible looking i was like yes love it <laughs> They're just like sharpied on. <laughs> no, the eyeliner, just the two dashes of eyeliner. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! I recent we've been recently rewatching The Simpsons, and there's the one where Uncle Leo gets his eyebrows burned off, and then Elaine like paints them back on, but like, and they they look angry. They're angled <laughs> downward, and the doctor comes back, and he's like, "Calm down, Mister Seinfeld. <laughs> Don't need to get upset." It just looks like it's two like. Those pink <laughs> pinball machine paddles. <laughs> yeah, it's very, it's so silly, but it's funny. Oh, all right. So, <laughs> I know you guys come here for uh, ramblings and Seinfeld references, but <laughs> I'm going to interrupt that with some talk about the Japanese crime syndicates. <laughs> yeah. It was fun. Oh, so I got inspired a little bit. I had listened to an episode of Wine and Crime that was called Yakuza Crimes. <laughs> oh, okay. And although I didn't re-listen to it before this one because I didn't really want to, like, use it as a source or anything. Yeah. Um, Canyon had covered, um, uh, like, just basically a lot to do with, um, the Yakuza and how they step in after some natural disasters with the relief efforts and kind of the goods and bads of all that. <laughs> oh, but okay. I started kind of from that vein and then I just, I, I ended up, you know, learning a lot about the Yakuza and they were pretty interesting and I 
still I'm not an expert and I know everyone knows they're not going to come to a podcast necessarily for like (laughs) to use as their research material for their (laughs) thesis I would hope not (laughs) (laughs) but I know it's just like sometimes you're like I just want you to know like I did my best right yeah I I I tried yeah you read the comments on some articles even on like britannica.com and they're like they should do some more research, like, read this and this and this before they talk about this. And you're like, well... <laughs> One of the articles was written by a white ever. guy. I know. I'm sure we don't know all the ins and outs of it if we had grown up in Japan. <laughs> yeah. So, the Yakuza also go by a couple different names or terms that I didn't look up how to say. The <laughs> Yakuza, aka the Boryokudan or the Gokudo, are Japanese gangsters. Boryokudan seems to be a more formal name. It translates basically to violence groups. Oh. <laughs> I thought it was kind of a bit... on the nose. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's like that sounds very generic. They are an interesting bunch, for sure. (laughs) The term Yakuza can be used to refer to the individual gangsters or uh, organized crime groups or just Japanese organized crime in general. So Uh, you you might hear it different ways. And the term itself comes from a very crappy hand in a game of... uh, The term comes from a very crappy hand in a game of cards. It's believed to have come from a, quote, worthless hand in a Japanese card game similar to Baccarat or Blackjack. Um, I haven't played Baccarat, but I've played Blackjack. That's basically just adding up to 21. It's pretty yeah. easy, I think. But the yeah, the, it's the cards Ya, Ku, and Sa, or 8, 9, and 3. And when added up, they give the worst possible total. <laughs> so, this will, that'll probably make a little bit more sense as I get into their history yeah. more. But it's it's interesting. If you've ever played Crib, Cribbage. No. Um, oh, it's good. I like it. It's actually pretty fun. Um, you know, but it's, yeah, it's one with the board with the pegs so you can keep track on. And, like, if it reminds me of when you get uh, a 19 hand in crib, you might call it. Uh, because if you say, I got a big whopping 19, it means uh, you got shit because there's no actual hand that adds up to the, like, number of points 19. <laughs> oh. So that's what that just reminds me of when I read it. It's like, oh, it comes from a crappy hand. Yakuza 893. It's weird. I didn't know that. Yeah, and like my mom plays, used to play crib a lot in cribbage. I like crib. We taught it to rain. Yeah, it's easy to, to pick up. Um, it's just like, you know, you count the different points for pairs or runs or different things like that. Um... And if people are really feeling mean, they can steal points, so that, of course, makes it fun and competitive. (laughs) (laughs) Alright, so these guys, um, they adopted and appropriated different samurai-like rituals, and most of the Yakuza have these kind of stylized tattoos that end up covering most of their body, which I'll talk about a little bit, but you might have seen pictures of them. Because usually you would see them covered, yeah, like kind of up to their... Or dragons. Yeah. Dark blues, greens, and it goes up to like wherever, you know, maybe they can cover with like a dress shirt. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) They're covered and then it's up to their neck, but then their neck is... And then you'll see them like dressed up like... Or not dressed up, but like like wearing like the little kind of loincloth that you samurai or... Samurai? Who's the other guys? The big sumo. The fat guys. (laughs) Oh, <laughs> so the wrestlers, you'll see them wearing like the kind of a sumo wrestler type of loincloth situation. <laughs> okay, never seen that before. <laughs> Normally they're wearing suits. Yeah. In, in all the action pic- movies I watch, oh. they're always wearing a suit. 
Oh, I will send you some pictures like we talked about for the, yeah, for the website and like some of the ones I'm going to put on Instagram because, um, yeah, a lot of the pictures I saw, they're like showing them off for like festivals and stuff like that where they're showing uh, off the tattoos. That makes more sense. I'm like, why are they just walking around in loincloths all the time? <laughs> but yeah, showing off their tattoos. That makes more sense. For certain situations down the line, yeah. Um... They enjoy many of the same popular mob activities that probably most gangsters around the world do. I don't know. Yeah. But such as blackmail, extortion, smuggling, prostitution, drug trafficking, gambling, and loan sharking. Yeah. Sounds... Yeah. About right. Just your normal. We're all the same people inside. <laughs> yeah. Uh, they control many businesses all over Japan. Yeah, again, we could be talking about Italian as I messed up earlier. The Sopranos. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, they, they owned restaurants, bars, trucking companies, talent agencies, taxi fleets, factories, all sorts of businesses. Wow. It's cool. I mean, it's interesting. <laughs> I should say. Did, I have a question. Uh, Did you and Pat yes. ever watch on, I think it was the History Channel, they used to have a show, what was it called? And it was like, they'd be whatever versus whatever, and they'd rate like, oh, so, and they'd rate like yeah. the person's weapons and stuff, and they had it like a Yakuza one, where it was like the Yakuza against like another crime group, and they rated yeah, like- Yeah, it was like- warrior yeah. versus warrior or something to that effect yeah and they'd like raid all their weapons and be like oh well the yakuza used this and the equivalent of the other gang was this and then they'd be like how deadly of force like were these and how accurate could you be with them and stuff and right. then they'd and then they'd like point total it and then they'd simulate like a thousand battles to figure out what percentage the one group would win over the other and then they'd declare like a winner it was yeah. very scientific. Yeah, mm. I forgot about that show. I love that show. <laughs> I used to watch it all the time with my dad. Yeah. Like, we still watch Forged and Fire all the time. That one's I good, feel too. Like that, yeah, probably maybe done by the same people or whatever, where you're like, oh, yeah, now this week they're making a this. Yeah. <laughs> Double-handed broadsword or, like, <laughs> when he describes yeah. some of the things they have to make for, like, the handle and stuff, they're like... Fil finial and grip yeah. and cross guard and you're like what <laughs> i just like that they every week they brought in like the experts and they're always like my team's mm. gonna win these people are awesome blah 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 blah, blah. <laughs> and then like one team always lost and you're kind of like ha -ha. yes because they could take people across to yeah exactly they weren't people that necessarily existed in the same timeline or could yeah. have tested against each other like the huts ver i don't know timelines the, <laughs> the the romans versus the nazis there they're far enough away from each yeah. other <laughs> yeah and I, i'm pretty sure they had one episode even where they just threw in like zombies or something <laughs> yeah, stupid probably. it was like they're the the bite force of the average human is and i was like what <laughs> okay it is the history channel after yeah. all I'm like this is great <laughs> Yeah. Ooh, I should have asked you this before we started um, recording, but we, hang on. <laughs> did you watch any of the new Dexter yet? We just did last night. No, I okay. am probably going to watch it after the second episode airs so that I can watch like two back to back. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you're right. There was only one of that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Because also, Curse of, Curse of Oak Island premiered, speaking of history. <laughs> and they were, like, being super cagey. They were like, can you say if there's something like, oh, did you find gold? Like, the guy that interviews them now at the beginning of every season. Yeah. And they're like, we can't say, Maddie. <laughs> I don't know, it was... <laughs> My dad was watching stuff about it. I love um... it. <laughs> I think it was, like, their season recap interview episode or whatever, like, Digging Deep, I think it was called. Yes, they and did do a lot of those. Yeah. yeah, that was on for I don't know how many hours when I was at their place on Sunday. Oh, I know. It most just recaps the last episode. Yeah. Oh, I guess what it was this premiere episode was they were, like, 
pissed that like um the Nova Scotia like historical society or whatever it's called was like impeding some of their digging this time because they they have found so many crazy big structures now oh. underneath the swamp and stuff like they found a giant fucking wharf underneath the swamp that the people figured was a man-made swamp and they, now they figured it now they realize yeah it is and maybe they did sink a boat there because they found a giant stone fucking wharf under it <laughs> wow i don't know it was a whole it was two islands before and then they probably sunk a ship with a bunch of treasure on it and then did something to plug the area between the two islands and make a swamp. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Mob activities. There are several different theories as to the exact origins of the modern Yakuza. They may have descended, A, or one, from gangs of ronin or masterless samurai, who turned away from being a good samurai and toward being a bandit. Okay. Maybe, maybe, never know. They possibly descended from vigilante Samaritans who were defending villages from these rogue ronin, or masterless samurai. It just makes me okay. think of 47 ronin, because that's yeah. a Keanu Reeves movie. Yeah. <laughs> totally. We watched it not too long ago. Awesome. Pat loves a good Keanu Reeves. I movie. love Keanu Reeves. <laughs> How could you not? He's like he's Canadian. Yeah, he, he's like so nice. He's from Canada. Yeah, he's a wonderful human being. He just bought the the crew of John Wick four like Rolexes, custom Rolexes. Oh, nice. Yeah. Oh, just wait for it. I am. I have a like built in John Wick reference because of something that happens later. <laughs> Oh, God. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, or the um, Yakuza possibly came from bands of grifters and or gamblers in Japan's feudal period. So, there's there's theories is all I got from that. Or all really of know. the above. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, this is definitely one you can uh, look up more about and I'll, I'll cite a book later on. Like, I, it's like when you had to cut out so much about the binions. It's just like, there's just yeah. so much. Yeah. About it's fun to learn about, though. About pages worth of stuff about fucking Ted Binion. And yes, his dad, and after Benny. we posted. Yes! Oh, Benny. Love Jesus. Benny. Um, one of the one of the comments we got from a seriously sinister podcast who we love when we you know featured their promo, yeah. they said um, yeah one of them at least has taken a picture with the the million dollars there in Vegas. Ooh, that's why I said yeah. I wanted to go. I told my dad and my oh. dad's like I remember like the Horseshoe Casino. He's like if you and Alana yeah. go, make sure you just go during the day, because the downtown area, you don't want to go at night. Even the cab drivers say that. <laughs> it's not safe. I, yeah. I think I've heard that, too. I can see yeah. that. I mean, it's just just because of the amount of people, I would think, too. Well, because it's off. Like, it's off the strip, so that's oh, yeah. where, like, a lot of homeless people and stuff hang out. Oh, sure. Yeah. Like, I wouldn't hang out on Skid Row in L.A. Yeah. either yeah. <laughs> at night. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, for the Yakuza, the police estimated that it likely re reached its peak power in the 1960s with about 184,000 members at the time. Wow. They think. Yeah. <laughs> it's not like they can take an exact census, so I'm sure it's... <laughs> A very approximate, but Roll yeah, call. <laughs> still impressive. <laughs> However, by the early 2000s, they were probably less than half of that number, around 80,000 members and uh, quote unquote associates. <laughs> yeah, it's probably yeah. higher than that, though, but right, no way to know. <clears throat> they are divided into what I'm going to call sub gangs which then sit under umbrellas of crime conglomerates, about 20 such crime supergroups. It's a whole hierarchy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, you got specialty groups. 
I'm sure all the mobs do. <laughs> yeah. The, I like the names, though, I have to say. Because the largest is the Yamaguchi Gumi, which I kept being like, Yamaguchi. Wait, what was that little pet I used to have as a kid? Tamagotchi. Tamagotchi, It's yeah. just like, so... It, to me, it sounds so close, but I don't know. I'm white. <laughs> it, it sounds like a candy to me. It yeah. Sounds like a gummy candy. Gummy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was founded in 1915 by Yamaguchi Harukichi. So, within the groups, there's a very rigid hierarchy, and the leaders are known as the Oyabun, or boss. It literally translates to something like parent status oh. Gosh. <laughs> and, and the followers are known as Coburn or boon or i don't know or apprentices literally child status <laughs> so that's fun <laughs> i love that <laughs> I know. they are below <laughs> yeah it reminds me of motorcycle gangs honestly <laughs> kind of i don't know yeah yeah they take, a, uh, the Coburn, t the child, <laughs> take a blood oath when they join, and if broken, they are punished accordingly. This is usually done through a ritual where the Coburn cuts off his own pinky finger and presents it to his Oyabun. And this is what reminds me of John Wick 3, um, where he goes to find the Elder and the Desert. Yeah. And then to convince him... It's different because he ends up severing his ring finger and presenting yeah. it. I had to remind myself, but like to to sign a fealty that he wasn't gonna grieve, like yeah, just grieve his wife anymore. He was gonna be back in the service. <laughs> yeah, guess. yeah. Ugh, love John Wick though. <laughs> yeah. Well, now that you're watching Fringe, did you notice that Agent Broyles is the hotel manager in John Wick? <gasps> I don't think so. Yeah. Oh my god. I'm gonna, because, you know, I'm just gonna probably have to watch it because it takes forever to convince Pat to watch anything. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, ended up watching the last of the Hunger Games movies because Pat was playing his game so long the other night that I was like, Oh man, I have been watch. I watched those movies all by myself, and then I didn't couldn't find time to just watch the last one. <laughs> yeah, I did I the like, same thing. I had seen <laughs> all of them except the last one, so I rewatched like two, three, and then oh four because I barely remembered them. You were the one that would tell me they're like, yeah, they're fighting in the first one and in the second one, and they're fighting in the third one. Only it's a war. No. <laughs> yeah. Basically. Well, in, like, oh, the books especially. It's just like, oh my god, you're describing the same thing. You're running on the grass all the time. <laughs> like, oh my god. Yeah. yeah. Good actors, though. They had some... Yeah. I'll watch um, Woody Harrelson in anything. Ugh, Woody Harrelson, Elizabeth Banks. I yeah. was surprised when there was a guy that also was in The Expanse, who plays a guy named Amos. He's really and cute. young Alexander... Yeah. Ludwig or whatever yeah. from Vikings is in the first one. I remember being like, Kelsey! Yeah. I didn't know he got eaten. Yeah. <laughs> Little baby Bjorn. Yeah, baby Bjorn. Okay, I'm so sorry, you guys, my ADD. Okay, so, yeah, I bought, I, I, I'm finished Hunger Games. I'm, I'm caught up to all of you from, what, seven, ten years ago? <laughs> yeah. I remember that. Yeah, I've listened to podcasts where they're like, oh my god, I heard the uh, end of The Office, and everyone was like, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so yeah, the di the Yakuza are a very complicated entity with a very complicated Facebook status relationship with the police. <laughs> yeah. They have a long history of offering aid after national disasters. However, as you can imagine, they are not totally doing so out of the kindness of their hearts. No, they just get that mm -hmm. IOU back later, right? I mean, why do people go to war, right? The money, honey. Yeah. They were some of the first people on the scene to help after the 1995 um, 
Co- Kobe earthquake. I don't know. It's spelled like Kobe Bryant. So Kobe. <laughs> That's where my ta- my case takes place. <gasps> dun dun dun. In nineteen 19- in Kobe. Wait. <laughs> it yeah. It takes place a couple years after the earthquake. Ooh. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah, they suffered. The two earthquakes, I'm going to touch, like, I just, I don't talk about them in detail, but yeah, they suffered two in fairly quick succession. Like, you know, someone could have felt them in one lifetime. (laughs) Yeah. Easily. So I don't, so sidebar, I don't need to say anything, like, about the earthquake of Kobe then. Oh, no, mine has nothing about it. I don't even mention it, but it was just, I remember reading it that okay they're like yeah the area is kind of bad because it was suffering from the devastating effects of the 1995 earthquake and i was like oh cool not even oh. to that <laughs> yeah um <laughs> well all i have on the earthquake is on january 17th 1995 a major earthquake struck near the city of kobe kobe <laughs> i don't know i'm so sorry killing more than six thousand and making more than 45,000 people homeless. The Kobe quake, yeah, Jesus is right. And it was a result of an east-west strike-slip fault where the Eurasian and the Philippine plates interact. Ooh. Yeah, those things act up again later on. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Um, The Yakuza were also quick to respond with help after the 2011 tsunami earthquake disaster and the Fukushima nuclear disaster, which we'll talk about a little later, too. The Yakuza might help out because of something called the Ninkyo Code. I don't know if that's how you say it. Ninkyo? Tokyo? No. (laughs) (laughs) Um, and they sometimes refer to themselves as the Ninkyo Dantai, which means chivalrous organization. Oh, Ooh. so chivalrous. So chivalrous. Knight in shining armor. <laughs> yeah. Knight in shining armor that brings you drugs. Yeah. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> Knight in inked, inked armor. <laughs> yeah. The Ninkyo Code is a principle that all Yakuza live by. It forbids them to allow anyone else to suffer. (laughs) Sure. (laughs) Well, so that is interesting and cool, but it makes sense once you hear a little bit more because the uh, code has a history that stems from the old class system and the Yakuza come from the lowest of the low in the class system. They were a class of people so reviled they were not allowed to touch other human beings. This class was called the Burakumin. Burakumin. Wow. Yeah. They were the executioners, the butchers, the leather workers, and the undertakers. They all worked with death, and so because of that, they were all considered, like, unclean. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's interesting, and it definitely does happen around the world. It makes me think of that Sex and the City episode where they talk about the caste system while people are painting their toenails, because they're like, look, we pay for people to paint our toenails, <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so class system, caste system, oh yeah, it's a whole thing. Uh, especially over in Asia, I guess. But these people in the low class, the Burakumin, were dealt their worst blow when laws in 1603 were written to formally cast them out of society. Their children were denied education and many were forced out of cities to live elsewhere. Very sad. And today, it apparently persists, I guess, lists are apparently still passed around of all those families that were part of this caste, and descendants of the Burakumin are passed over for jobs. So, if that's true, that's really shitty still. Yeah, that's awful. Yeah. I mean, like, you do hear about people, maybe in North America, white people looking at 
names and resumes and if they are too foreign sounding yeah passing them over and like yeah you just hope that that shit doesn't still really go on today it can happen anywhere. but appara- and yeah yeah if this is true it still is happening and the lists reportedly still make up half of the yakuza members so still very much direct like descendants of this barakuman class mm. that's how a lot of gangs and stuff get members and people can't leave is because they can't get jobs oh. in anything else yeah like, that's what gives gangs their power to like bring in new members and keep people in right yeah. i suppose it's like same kind of thing sort of as once you go to jail or whatever you have a hard time yeah coming back into society <laughs> Yeah, if you don't have the right opportunities or people don't give you a, a second chance or anything or you're labeled something right away, like, yeah, how are you supposed to do anything else, you know? That's just it. It's very hard to break free. Mm-hmm. Break free from the chains. Um, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, if that still happens, ugh. So the Barracuman and their kids had to find another way to make a living if they weren't allowed to have legitimate work, just like you saying. <laughs> Those who didn't want to work the family trades turned to crime. They set up gambling temples and peddled stolen goods. And as the Yakuza evolved and grew, they kept their core values and creeds of silence, obedience, and loyalty. Yep. Loyalty is key. <laughs> <clears throat> Sorry. <laughs> I don't know why I had to cough there like I was part of a gang. Um, yeah, so, some were apparently allegedly asked to cut ties with their biological family, which would suck. It sounds like a cult when you say that. Yeah, that's a bit much. <laughs> it's like, uh, nope. And for their tattoos, I have a little bit. Part of showing this loyalty was getting your Yakuza tats covering your entire body basically is a sign of loyalty from your ass cheeks to your fingers almost every nook and cranny except yeah it doesn't it didn't seem to do much of the neck and face yeah although everybody is doing their freaking fingers nowadays and I, yeah. i've read i've read a lot of places that like the trendy little tiny finger tattoos like f- like they're so um high what movement area that finger tattoos would just they just go so much faster and just wear I mean, away yeah yeah i don't know probably i don't have any tattoos so i don't know what i'm talking about but i asked <laughs> pat's got one between his thumb and his forefinger you know kind of in that meaty area yeah and it's held up fine but like on your fingers where everybody has them nowadays it's I guess it's kind of like getting one on, like, the bottom of your foot or something, right? It's just going to go faster. Yeah, they talk... I don't know. That's, like, ink dropout. Like, when I got the sides of yeah. my feet done with the yeah, quotes and stuff, almost, like, I've had one of them had to be done twice, and I'll probably have to get it done a third time, and I only got them, like, six years ago. Um, but the... Because the ink right. drops out because the skin is so thick on the like side to the bottom of your foot and stuff so i think your fingers maybe it's because there's just literally no hardly any tissue there it's really just like a few layers of skin and then bone maybe there isn't enough tissue for the ink to hold up oh excuse me yeah because isn't one like is it on the arch of your foot sort of or on the other side Ah, uh, well, it's kind of like on the side to the top of my foot. Right, yeah. right. It looked like it hurt like a bitch. <laughs> it's actually not that bad. <laughs> yeah. Very cute. Oh, your tats are very cute. Yeah. <laughs> I'm planning uh, more. There's six so far. <laughs> yeah, because you had like initials or something. Yeah, I have foot, my family's right? initials on my wrist. Yeah, that's cute. I really like that. Yeah, my brother has the same, pretty much the same initials, like, set of initials with mine in the middle. Um, 
and mm. then her parents on the outside and he has his over in a different font but over his heart and i don't know if i want to get anything yet that has to do with i don't know necessarily my kid i don't know why that, that sounds bad but like you know like birth dates or anything like that um but i i just because i don't know that just isn't really me yeah I don't know, and sometimes it feels like maybe you're, if I'm gonna get some, yeah, maybe if you had like a couple kids, but I only get the one. Um, <laughs> but like I would get um, like the uh, astrological kind of symbol for Pisces or like the stars. Yeah. You know the star formation, and we're like I would get like some of the alchemical symbols. I'm like looking at them because I've put them up on my wall now. Mm. <laughs> I took down all the the pictures I had in here that were just we just had like little art pieces you know it was like well we've had these since Rain was a kid and I want to put up my own stuff and I thought Pat had them all on the wall with those things that kind of like they say they come off without a rip but sometimes they rip the wallpaper you know the yeah. ones but actually everything was up with just with like thumbtacks so I was like oh, I'm just gonna put all this shit up here and it looks great yeah <laughs> It's coming along. All right. Oh my god. Tats? Oh my god, that's where we got to. Ass cheeks of tats. Yep. Oh, and they got all... So, with the tattoos covering them, you know, in every nook and cranny, they got them in a traditional Japanese tattooing style called Irizumi. And it's very traditional. I guess it's the kind of one where you like apply it with a bamboo stick. So it's like that kind of one the poke at a time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, they do that However, in Vikings too. That goes. Right. Yeah. I feel like it was just the primitive form of tattooing. It's like, mm -hmm. yeah, oh, I had tattoos had to evolve somewhere. Yeah. Which blows yeah, my but mind. Yeah, but it blows So my mind. badass. Yeah. You're going to get one that way. I'm going to be like, okay, that's pretty awesome. It. The Rock, like, has some new, I don't know if it's just going to be an Instagram or whatever. I saw it, it on his Instagram about his, ta the evolution of his arm tattoo with the bull. <laughs> oh, yeah, because he was covering He's... up something else, wasn't it? Oh, could be. He's definitely got the, the, um, uh, not Hawaiian, that's not the word I want. Um, Maori? Samoan? Oh, Samoan. Samoan, yeah, yeah. The big it's part covers one peck or whatever, and then one whole arm piece. Yeah, same as his cousins do that wrestle. Mm -hmm. But like, yeah, no, he's got the other arm done now too. It's got like a whole. I'm sure it's got a whole bull thing. Anyway. Yeah, it's got like on his shoulder, on the side of his shoulder. I remember. Yeah, I know. Both. It looks like both of his shoulders are gonna be. Completely sleeved out. Oh yeah, wow. <laughs> love it. And you guys, if we get to a hundred patreons, I will fucking tattoo castles and cryptids all over my butt cheeks. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it here first. <laughs> I wouldn't. I wouldn't recommend the butt cheeks. <laughs> that would. That would hurt. Lots of lots of cushion. I no, thought that hurts but less. It's such like <laughs> sensitive skin. Oh my god. Ugh, all right. I'll, uh, I'm gonna be a baby either way, so it doesn't matter. No. Um, <laughs> okay, so they got the traditional tattoos, and they also would get um, the finger and the pinky ring cut off punishment that I think I talked about. Yeah. But I had learned that originally it had a more practical purpose. So it, they, if they would just cut off part of that finger, then you would have a, a less good grip on your sword. So if you, you know, fucked up multiple times, then they would take off more of the finger and then it would end up really fucking you up and you couldn't hold your sword as well. And just basically you relied then more on the group. So it's just a way to keep you like kind of indentured to them, I guess. But if you have a yeah. whole group of guys that are fucking <laughs> hands are messed up, then all of you are gonna die. <laughs> no! I'm sorry. I feel like... 
it wouldn't be great if he had a bunch of dummies working for you that would just keep fucking up. No. <laughs> yeah. And then those people are supposed to be your bodyguards and then you can hold a fucking sword. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like, yeah, right, no. I'm gonna die. You know, come on. I just feel like they're just, they're Asian. They're way more disciplined than us. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, you cut off the tip for your first defense and all that stuff. And fun-ish fact, to this day, <laughs> nearly every illegal drug in Japan is imported by the Yakuza. Wow. Oh, they're still in it to win it. But yeah, they do a lot of really shitty stuff, like also trafficking women, which I'm not going to get into, but they lure foreigners in with the promises of legit jobs, and then once they get here, they kind of just kind of force them into sex work, allegedly. Yeah, that happens, I'm sure, around the world. Oh, I'm sure. It's, yeah, exactly, it's just shitty, wherever. And they eventually moved into white-collar crime, kind of less bloody work, dip their toes into real estate. They've, they've evolved over the times. Come on, they've been hanging around since the 1600s. Sorry, yeah. I just hit my link. Yeah. Um, some of the people they sent to work for the real estate companies were called the Jigaya. Oh, I don't know how to say that. Jigaya? Jigaya? And the quote said that real estate agents would hire a Japanese gangster when they wanted to demolish a residential area and put in a new development, but couldn't get one stingy landowner to leave. The Jigaya's <laughs> job was to get them out. They'd put unpleasant things in their mailboxes, scrawl obscene words on their walls, or in at least one case, empty the contents of an entire septic tank in through the window. Yeah, From... that's one way to do it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it reminds me of people just turning over their chamber pots out the window. <laughs> yeah. Just chucking shit out the window. Oh, you don't have a, uh, I don't have a pot to piss in. Here it is. <laughs> Um, the police weren't happy about this left turn into white-collar crime, and they made it illegal to deal with the Yakuza business in the early 90s, although being a member is not illegal. I mean, I don't know if, like, being a Hell's Angel is strictly illegal either. You just have to make sure you don't get caught killing anybody. <laughs> yeah, you kind of get watched as being an associate. Like, I would think if you're yeah. out with them and stuff and you're riding a motorcycle as well and you're stopped where they're stopped and parked near them, they're going to mm -hmm. run your plate. They go around and they just pretty much they'll just drive past and they'll take everybody's plate and then just drive away and then they'll just look everybody up and then just link them in the system. Like my brother and my dad, when they try and cross the border like driving or anything it pops up like known affiliates to like motorcycle gangs and we get like we either get pulled over and extra searched or we get like extra questioned about where we're going it does yeah because my grandpa was part of the rebels and then my dad and my grandpa like knew some like a bunch of hell's angels yeah. Oh, too funny. Yeah, my I, mom and my dad used to ride with the rebels and sometimes the Hells Angels and stuff when they were younger. Oh my gosh, that's yeah. so cool. I've, like, known friends that, like, parents... I thought it was all Hells Angels. I don't even know if I know who the rebels are, but <laughs> it sounds cool. Yeah, they're, like, a smaller one. Most of their members are, like, older now. But, like, my grandpa's even in a book and stuff about, like, the rebels, I think. Ooh. Yeah. My dad That's and my so brother cool. have the book. They're pretty sure he's one of, the, like, the guys on the picture of the cover, too. There's, like, a group of them. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah, you gotta save that book, then. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. So, the police weren't so happy about the white-collar crime and tried to make it kind of harder to deal with the Yakuza and so it actually ended up making it very hard for the Yakuza and some members were let go because the anti-Yakuza 
laws, the anti-Yakuza laws tied up all their assets so they couldn't pay all the members. Unfortunately. Oh, okay. Yeah. So they started to lose some people. And this could be now why they're trying to clean up their image, helping out in times of need as a big PR stunt. Some would say. They even hand out cat candy at Halloween from their headquarters. That's a cool picture. I should send you that one. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> They're handing out Halloween candy. Okay. <laughs> yeah. That's oh my interesting. God. I thought it was cute. <laughs> I mean, doesn't mean any, like, group and stuff that's organized crime isn't doing some things that are good. Like, no. A lot of them are trying to help, like, and do you make donations to people in, like, tough neighborhoods, because that's where they came from a lot of the times and stuff like that. Right. That sounds similar to these guys from what yeah. I've learned. I mean, in, in a way. But then the, the, these guys also seem to take advantage. So, yeah, it's like, I think it's like anybody. It's like any person isn't good or bad yeah. or evil. Yeah, not straight up evil or whatever. Okay. So, the Kudo Kai is a Yakuza family based out of Kita Kyushu. Bless you. <laughs> no. <laughs> On the island of Kyushu. And in 1998, Satoru Nomura, one of their top leaders, allegedly shot a 70-year-old man, Kunihiro Kajiwara. The reason? <laughs> the victim, Mr. Kajiwara, quote, refused to give favorable treatment to Yakuza in public works projects. Okay. I... Uh, <laughs> I know, it's just a random encounter. I kind of wanted to include that one, the public works. Made me think of my dad. He literally works in public works. He's a civil engineer. <laughs> and I, I think of him because he would answer his phone, good afternoon, public works. <laughs> <laughs> like, you can't just kill someone just because you don't like what they're doing and they work in this sector. Like, that's just not fair. It just really kind of hit home. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> It's stupid, but whatever. Ugh. These, okay, so this Kudokai family, I guess, include, or other of their crimes include grenade assaults on the homes of executives that worked for Kyushu Electric Power, Molotov cocktails thrown at future Prime Minister of Japan Shinzo Ape? His last name is spelled ape. I don't know if that's how you pronounce it, but it is. Hmm. Like monkey, you know. <laughs> yeah. I love a good and Molotov cocktail. I love a good Molotov cocktail. I dressed up as a Molotov girl for Halloween from Free Guy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and then Pat was like, he was like, I was like, oh, I wish I had a fake gun. I should have thought of that. You know, I had suspenders and whatever. I had some accessories, but he, like, grabs, like, one of our, these water guns we had. <laughs> like, super so crazy. Here you go. I love I'm like, it. oh, this is so cool. And I, like, go to pose with it. And he's like, yeah, but look where the trigger is. Like, <laughs> it's just this big-ass gun that had, like, these two big areas. I was, like, not even holding it by the right. <laughs> Oh. Near the trigger. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> I got this. Um, yeah, oh, so the Molotov cocktails were because of... They were <laughs> asked to attack the Prime Minister on behalf of a man named Koyama who was pissed because he didn't get the cash he wanted for supporting some mayoral candidate. No. It's all political. Like, I was like, I don't understand. This is craziness. Payoffs and bribes. Oh, yeah. Just, I'm so mad at you. I'm just going to throw this through your window. Yeah. And also, there was the murder of Nagasaki Mayor 
Icho Ito. So on April 17th, 2007, Ito was shot twice in the back by Tetsuya Shiru. Shiru was a senior member of a Nagasaki affiliate of the Yamagachi Gumi conglomerate uh, uh, or family that we mentioned. And Shiru also happened to be involved in um, a long dispute with city officials over damage done to his car. Damage done to his car when he drove it into a, quote, hole caused by construction. Oh, potholes. Welcome to Alberta. I feel like <laughs> this is all coming down to a pothole. Yeah, it's really bizarre. <laughs> it's just like a bunch of petty criminals. Yeah. <laughs> Some reporters believed it may be really the mayor's refusal to choose Yakuza companies for lucrative construction contracts. Uh, I guess that's the reason for the attack. Hmm. Ugh. Of the mayor. Yeah. So, the Yakuza have also started dabbling in the stock market and insider trading. However, they don't just use tips to invest in sweet stock deals. They beat and threaten tips out of people, too. So Lovely. then they can invest <laughs> in deals. Oh, just lovely. Exactly. So then last but certainly not least is um, some of what happens in the wake of the earthquake slash tsunami. Uh, specifically the one in 2011 because as we talked about they also had a, a friggin' quake in 95, right? Yeah. Isn't that what we said? Yeah. So... That's like, yeah, 15 years-ish, right? It's just like, oh my gosh, there's a lot to deal with. It's like poor Haiti. They yeah. had a couple of earthquakes and now, oh my god, I think I wrote down a little bit about it because I couldn't remember it, but if I'm not mistaken, they also had their prime minister assassinated. Okay, so the Japan earthquake and tsunami of 2011 occurred on March 11th, 2011. And from Britannica.com, the event began with a powerful earthquake off the northeastern coast of Honshu, Japan's main island, which caused widespread damage on land and initiated a series of large tsunami waves that devastated many coastal areas of the country, most notably in the Tohoku region, uh, northeastern Honshu. The <laughs> The Tsunami. <laughs> <laughs> it's like sometimes my family will call her Michelle Pfeiffer, just jokingly, because that's how it's spelled. Anyway, the Tsunami <laughs> also instigated a major nuclear accident at a power station along the coast. End quote. Yeah. It was a 9.0 magnitude quake on the Richter scale. It had to do with the Japan Trench. An uh, or a Eurasian plate and the Pacific plate. Gotta love those tectonic plates. Yeah. Messing Ugh. about. Learned about those on Bill Nye. <laughs> <laughs> that was my science guy growing up. <laughs> Bill, 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 Bill. Bill Nye, Bill the, science Nye the science guy. guy. Yeah. Science it. rules. He has a podcast now, too. I just haven't listened to it, I don't think. I oh, love him. What's wrong with me? I love him so much. I, I have a pair of good luck socks that are Bill Nye the Science Guy. <laughs> oh my god. You do have the best socks and accessories and shoes. <laughs> <laughs> um, him and then we'd watch for other weird science shows. Um, oh shit. They did Roy, uh, I remember I learned about the rainbow and Roy G. Biv. What was it? Oh, Beekman's World. Did you ever see that one? No. Maybe not. Yeah, it maybe it was just also a little Canadian science kind of skit show where there was a professor whose name was like Beekman and there was like a girl also in the lab and then there was like a giant rat, a guy in a rat costume. I don't know. It. <laughs> wow. It's how I learned about centrifugal force. I don't know. <laughs> Okay, so the quake in Japan. Poor Japan. Jesus. They had a rough go of it. Um, oh, what was I thought interesting was 
these plates fucking around that caused this 9.0 magnitude quake that caused all these problems in 2011, um, there was almost two years later, um, in December 2012, a 7.3 tremor that originated from the same boundary region, but it caused no injury and little damage. That's so good. Just like, oh my god. Oh yeah, yeah. It just seems bizarre to me that it could be so different, I guess. I yeah. Know. I think there's a huge difference between a 7 and a 9. It's like I mean, a hundred true, times true. or something. Yeah. But I just also wonder if it wasn't just like just just weird luck of what was happening at the time that didn't cause a tsunami or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but at, during the original tsunami that I'm talking about, the 2011 one, it was so bad, one wave made it six miles or about ten kilometers inland and overflowed the Notori River. The waves crashed into shore and then swept back out, taking debris and victims with them. Mm-hmm. It was really bad. It actually generated waves 12 or 11 and 12 feet high along the coasts of Kauai and Hawaii. Wow. And roughly 18 hours after the quake, waves about a foot high reached the coast of Antarctica, causing a portion of the Salzburger ice shelf to break off its outer edge. Wow. It was enormous, right? Yeah, for it to, the waves and everything, to make it that far and still be at any height is pretty crazy. I know. I know, I don't remember if I'd heard that before. It's just like, holy shit. And then the death toll. Approximately 18,500 people were dead or missing after, and millions, I can imagine, in damage was done. Mm Mm-hmm. But the biggest concern in the aftermath, after the immediate deaths, of course, you know, all that shit we just talked about, yeah, was, yeah, like the status of several of the nuclear power stations in the Tohoku region. So reactors were shut down at three nuclear plants closest to the quake's epicenter as a precaution. However, tsunami waves damaged the backup generators at a few of these plants, especially the Fukushima Daiichi, I don't know how to say it, plant, number one plant. So there were a few factors that led to the disaster. With the power off, the cooling systems failed in three reactors within a few days of the quake. This led their cores to overheat and the fuel rods to partially melt. Factory workers say that some melting was due to pipe bursting from the quake's vibrations also. Probably. Hmm. Yeah. Doesn't really matter at this point. Uh, Quote, melted material fell to the bottom of containment vessels in reactors 1 and 2 and burned sizable holes through the floor of each vessel, which partially exposed the nuclear material in the cores. Explosions resulting from the pressurized hydrogen gas in the outer containment buildings enclosing reactors 1, 2, and 3, along with fire touched off by rising temperatures in spent fuel rods stored in reactor 4, led to the release of significant levels of radiation from the facility in the days and weeks following the earthquake. Uh, From Britannica.com So, like... I honestly kind of thought it was, like, Chernobyl, where we had, like, a yeah. meltdown, but it seems like it was a more of a a slow-ish leak of radiation. Yeah. Like this one. Yeah. It makes me I don't think know. of Chernobyl, though. Yes. Which, next sentence, we'll <laughs> get to. Um, <laughs> in mid-April, Japanese, uh, this is a quote. I should say. In mid-April, Japanese nuclear regulators elevated the severity level of the nuclear emergency 
at the Fukushima Daiichi facility from 5 to 7, the highest level on the scale created by the International Atomic Energy Agency. Placing the Fukushima accident in the same category as the Chernobyl accident, which had occurred in the Soviet Union in 1986. Yeah, that's scary. So you're right. It was the same, like, deadliness, I guess. Yeah. Ugh. Horrible. Yeah. But yet it wasn't like a, I don't know, like, it just didn't seem like this, it wasn't the same exact style of meltdown or whatever, you know, but it's no, still just No, it doesn't a, just seem to be, like, explosions and huge fire and buildings caving yeah. in and all that stuff. Yeah, and I have a little bit more on how it kind of had to do with the quake and stuff. It was thought that the area would be uninhabitable for decades, but the levels, the radiation levels, eventually started to come down enough to allow residents back in and for relief and rebuilding efforts to begin. After the quake, the Japanese Prime Minister had set up an emergency command center in Tokyo and sent 100,000 uh, members of the Japanese Self-Defense Force to deal with the crisis, quote-unquote. On the 31st of January 2013, Japanese police arrested a Yakuza boss uh, on suspicion of illegally sending workers into the Fukushima disaster zone. Oh. Fun fact, that was about the time I started at AMA, I think. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Get my job, things are going on around the world. Yeah. Nuclear disasters. Yeah, so, okay, this boss, Yoshinori Arai, is the head of a crime group in northern Japan that's affiliated with the Sumiyoshi. Yoshi. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Kai Syndicate. The Sumiyoshi Kai Syndicate is the second most powerful crime syndicate in all of Japan with 12,600 members. So... I mean, that sounded impressive when I first read it, but then I read how big the yeah. whole Yakuza was, and I was like, yeah, they're kind of a little, little bit of it. Yeah. So, yeah. This Arai guy sent day laborers into a nuclear decontamination project in the Fukushima prefecture as part of the aid efforts after the nuclear crisis. Uh, I guess a prefecture, as I learned, is kind of a region in Japan. It has, Japan has 47 prefectures, so it's like a jurisdiction, I guess. Oh, okay. Also, <laughs> 47 prefectures, 47 ronin. No, I don't know. <laughs> That's what it made me think of. But, unfortunately, the workers, uh, you know, that I just said were dealt... Uh, that were hired, being hired to deal with the, the fallout of all these lovely nuclear disasters and things, they only got paid half of their promised wages. They were owed 20,000 yen per day, or about $216. And the website didn't specify, but I assume U.S. dollars. Yeah. But they, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But they got half of that amount, and the Yakuza ended up getting the other half. So not good. No. And <laughs> there are billions of potential dollars to be made off the reconstruction of the regions that were devastated by the March 2011 uh, earthquake slash tsunami and nuclear disaster. Ooh. Okay. And... So yeah, of course the, the crime syndicate comes in because they're like, we want to make billions of these potential dollars, which yeah. you're like, are you just stepping in because you don't want people to suffer, <laughs> as your creed says, or are you just really there to make money? And probably a bit of both. Take advantage oh, totally. of the situation a little bit. Oh, totally. And then hopefully clean up their image. And the Yakuza were actually pretty hard up at the time of this 2011 disaster, so they jumped at the opportunity to make some quick cash. 
they were hurting. They were hurting, my words, because the new, <laughs> quote, stricter anti-gun laws introduced in 2011 and increased police crackdowns, end quote. The new laws effectively made it illegal to do business with crime syndicates or have ties with any gangs. So, that would hurt them, for yeah. sure. And in Tohoku, one of the hardest hit regions of the quake, criminals are involved in all sorts of aspects of the rebuild, from demolition to waste removal. One of the workers they hired for Fukushima um, relief, I guess, <laughs> said we were given no insurance for health risks, no radiation meters even. We were treated like nothing, like disposable people. They promised things and then kicked us out when we received a large radiation dose. Ugh. Yeah, I don't like that. Ooh, also disposable people. Makes yeah. me think of a Metallica lyric. But, because... <laughs> possibly because Pat had them on earlier, but also possibly because they talk about how, like, soldiers end up being used as... They have one song that's called, like, Disposable Heroes. Yeah. And it's like... Like, these poor people, like, as I'll mention, they sound like they just got them off the street, you know? They're just like, oh, yeah, you want a, like, quick job? Like, come do this. It's like, oh, wait, by the way, radiation is a big thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, but like I said, I couldn't include it all. So uh, for the history of all these types of things, there is a book called Yakuza and Nuclear Energy, Diary of an Undercover Reporter Working at the Fukushima Plant by journalist Tamahiku Suzuki. Oh, okay. Suzuki. Which I good. said to you before we started recording, David Suzuki used to do a Canadian show called The Nature of Things, and yeah. God damn it if us Canadians didn't love it. <laughs> I've never watched any of it. Okay, well mainly what I was telling you was that Sandra O oh talked about it on Jimmy Kimmel. Yeah. <laughs> I knew from her sweatshirt who had that little fro and that outline. I was like, that's David Suzuki. Because it said the nature of things. Which, yeah. like I said to you, my brother was also a fan of that show. Shout out, Daniel. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> Just to close here. Yeah, it wasn't great because the Yakuza... Jacuzzi? Jacuzzi? Kazoo. Um, kazoo. <laughs> the Yakuzu. Yakuza. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah. Let's cut this. Oh my god. <laughs> the Yakuza uh, found desperate people to, to dangerous work, poor people, homeless, mentally handicapped. Uh, TEPCO, the electricity company managing the plant, asked for recruiters to find, quote, those who are not afraid of dying. Oh. I.e. to help with the cleanup. Yeah, not great. Not great at all. Yeah, hoping that so, they die not so we don't have to pay them. Exactly. So publicly in July of 2011, they announced they were no longer working with the Yakuza. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for um, the update. <laughs> Maybe you just shouldn't have in the first place. <laughs> oh, sorry, I gotta stop sitting that way because I'm not talking up at my remote. And by remote, I mean microphone. <laughs> <laughs> um, subcontractors were told to sign a mandatory form saying they had no ties to the mob, but subcontractors can basically use front companies... So it's difficult to trace or verify that they don't have any ties to undercover crime, I guess. And Tetsuo Nayuki was made a senior official with the Japanese Nuclear Regulation Authority, or what they called the NRA, <laughs> which made me laugh because NRA forever, NRA, the National Rifle Authority. And yeah, fuck them. 
<laughs> well, I didn't know because the only reason I thought that I knew who the NRA was was because they freaking mentioned, like, had a reference to it on the Simpsons opening. So I was like, wait, <laughs> does she know NRA? Okay, but yeah, in this case, it's the Nuclear Regulation Authority who was set up to restore public trust in Japan and abroad regarding nuclear regulation. But this senior official um, was being fired. So the senior official, Nayuki, was being fired as this criminal boss was being arrested. I'm sorry, that part was a little confusing to me, but they were definitely in bed with each other. It came out that on January 22nd, 2013, not long after being appointed unofficial, Nayuki leaked a report on the nuclear sector to the Japan Atomic Power Company. The NRA had been evaluating seismic risks at every power plant in Japan. And good for them after such a disaster a few years yeah. earlier. But they had found a problem. An active fault was found under the uh, Tsuruga plant and that the reactors would have to be decommissioned at that plant. And the uh, JAPC wanted to get their hands on that report, quote, before its public release in order to repair its rebuttal. Which I just love the word rebuttal. <laughs> <laughs> but they vehemently denied giving Nayuki any money to leak this information. To which I say, sure. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> and that's that's all I got. Thank you. I know that was a <laughs> long one. <laughs> it was but good. I thought it would be a little bit interesting. It was fun to research. It was. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, shout out to my bro who likes organized crime and maybe next year I'll do Al Capone or something for him because he also loves just like the untouchables and all that, you know, jazz. <laughs> Yeah, well, my case when we come back is going to be super downer. Boo. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about it. <laughs> I mean, what? I guess mine wasn't low walk in the roses either, no. but I, don't, I didn't have anything specific, really. Yeah. <laughs> but it was yeah. still really good. Other than, like, almost 20,000 people dying in, like, you know, a natural yeah. disaster. <laughs> yeah. But, oh gosh. Yeah. Well, oh man. Be right okay. back. Be right back. Continue with Japanese true crime. <laughs> oh my god. And we're back. Yeah. Hold on. <laughs> so, as I said, mine's going to be a downer. Um but I realized Jimmy it. Downer. Have you yeah. ever seen that sketch on SNL? Yeah. It always goes, <laughs> wah, wah. Oh, yeah. I think we might have talked about it, too. Yeah. Because, yeah. <laughs> it's pretty funny. <laughs> um, but I realized when we took our break that mm. I figured out who this person reminds me of. They actually remind me of, like, Edmund Kemper. The third. <gasps> What? Um, in just their fucked upness. <laughs> and how the they... clinical term. <laughs> yeah, and like yeah. how they talk about it and everything. You'll see. I have some quotes and stuff and just how they talk about describing like what they did and stuff. It seems very like like disassociated that they're just kind of like reading something. It's not something that they actually did. Ooh. Yeah. Interesting. So this uh, case is kind of famously called the Kobe Child Murders. And oh. You said Kobe. Yeah. Um, so that's where the uh, earthquake you mentioned in 95 hit. Um, these oh, yeah. Yeah, so these murders... Sorry, I'm like, oh yeah, earthquake! I don't mean it sounds so happy. <laughs> I just mean I recognize it now, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> uh, these murders occurred in Suma, Kobe, Japan in 1997. 
So they were still dealing with the effects of the earthquake, it said. And there were still, like, big populations of people that were poor and homeless and stuff and struggling. But my case doesn't really talk that much about it. But that was going on in the background. Right. They should have just been enjoying things like the Lion King and not (laughs) rebuilding their country. Yeah. Right. That sucks. Um, So for this, I tried to look up pronunciation of a few things and couldn't find anything so oh i didn't even bother you would have felt much better (laughs) (laughs) i'm like i i tried i gave it the the try but apparently these words are some of them are just specific to this case and are meaningless outside of it so fun i almost kind of figured it would might be like chinese where my friend told me that like because she, like, teaches, like, Mandarin now or whatever, and she's yeah. like, depending how you say ma, it can mean, like, horse or mother, depending if it's, like, ma, or, like, ma, 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 <laughs> you know? It's, uh, like, yeah. <laughs> apparently it's all pronunciation with, you know, some some Asian languages. <laughs> That's scary. So, Keep me Better just to that. just stay out of it, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um. yeah. So, it's just gonna, my opening sentence, just right to the horrible. So, on May 27th, the decapitated head of an 11-year-old boy... There it is. Uh, Okay. (laughs) I said it gets horrible. It's a a downer. Uh, His name was John Hayes. And his head was found uh, in front of the school gates at his school in Tinohata Elementary, where John attended as a special, like, needs or special education student. Oh my god. Yeah. No. Yeah. Um, at this time, he had been missing for three days. And after his head was found on May 27th, later that day, the police did find his mutilated and headless body uh, under a house in the woods near the school. Oh my god. Oh, you said decapitated. I just... Headless really drove it home. I don't know. That's horrible. Oh my god. Yeah. I'm so young. Fuck. Um, so his head, as I said, was found in front of his school, um, on a school Uh, day. Uh, How? Oh my god, I'm sorry! You're gonna be even more shocked when we get to who committed this, because it was fucking crazy. Yeah. I can just imagine telling my junior high school age child, like... Yeah. What would happen? It's and like awful. and sometimes they like they have kindergartners that go to their same school. Yeah. It's a wide range of ages. Like that could have been seen by a whole shit ton of kids. Thankfully it was it's unlikely it was seen um by kids because it was found by the school janitor, um, who was there hours before any students really started arriving for class. Um, so it's unlikely any students really saw it unless you happen to be walking past the thing, but, yeah. I mean, okay, that's, that's good, I guess. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, so the, it it is kind of graphic. Um, so he had been beheaded with a handsaw, and the head as well as the body had been mutilated, Uh, His eyes had been gouged out, and his mouth had been slit from ear to ear. Oh, that is really excessive. Yeah. Uh, I don't like it. No. Stuffed inside his mouth was a note that was written in red pen that identified the killer they had named themselves as Sakakibara. Um... Which in my research, it pretty much, there's just, they kind of signed the notes as six different characters, which I'll explain, but 
I guess these six characters, even though each of them is a different word, in overall it can be pronounced as Sakaki Bera Sato, I guess. Yeah, so the six characters kind of okay. have a different meaning. Altogether, they mean Sakaki, Bera, Sato, but separate, they each have a different meaning that I'll explain in a bit. Um, and this is, sorry, what's found on a note at the scene of one of the crimes. Yeah, it was inside the head. Inside the mouth. Uh, yeah. Right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah. Like I said, this is going to be a downer. Um, <laughs> oh, sure. And, like, I, I don't know. I think my brain, like, is like, immediately block that out. You don't need that information. That's right. gross. <laughs> yeah. Have fun editing this and listening to it a second time. Um, <laughs> I remember we were doing the cryptids one, and I was like, something, what, aliens? And you're like, something like, I just said that. And I was like, yeah, yeah but I don't know. <laughs> yeah. And it's just a lot. And then... There had been a lot of cryptids at that point. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like, oh my god, why? Okay. <laughs> um, so the note that was found inside mm. John's mouth uh, read, mm. This is the beginning of the game. Try to stop me if you can, or if you can, you stupid police. I desperately want to see people die. It is the thrill for me to commit murder. A bloody judgment is needed for my years of great bitterness. And then that's where it ended, but there was also some misspelled English, like, written on the note. Um, they had attempted, I think, to write school killer, but they wrote shul killer. Oh, no, no, no. S-H-O-O-L-L killer. Um, that's only funny if you're quoting, uh, what is that <laughs> animated movie, Mastermind? Megamind. Mega mine. Sure. Right. He goes, I go to shul. <laughs> you know, he's talking about going to school. I'm obsessed with that movie. Um, I do like that's a good quote. That's a I fun one to movie. say. <laughs> it was the first movie I ever saw in 3D. <laughs> oh no and way! It's a hundred percent unnecessary for it to be in 3D, but it was the first oh, one probably. I did, and it was an IMAX. Cause why not? <laughs> <laughs> Just, it's Will Ferrell too, right? But uh, you, I if Will that was your Ferrell first one and, like, in I I'm Max, I'm sure you don't remember it. It was probably all you could see. <laughs> so much going on. And there's like you would have seen it at the yeah. There's a big IMAX theater here. I didn't have yeah. an IMAX theater where I grew up. Oh my god, that <laughs> sounds like such a luxury. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, it's um, not important. So, with the note, police said that the writing style and the fact that there was a note left uh, reminded them of the Zodiac murders that occurred mm. in the San Francisco Bay Area in the 1960s. And there was also right. a cross-like symbol um, written in red pen that was left on the note. Ew. Yeah. A cross-like symbol. Yeah, I think I have a picture of it. I can kind of describe it. Oh, I, I'm i sorry. I could have had pictures on the drive for this one. Because definitely there's some cool pictures. Uh, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll send them to you. Yeah, so it kind of sense. almost looks like a picture of um, like a fan. Like a mm. rotating fan. It almost looks like a circle with like okay. little fan blades and then it has like kind of a, a post that would be like a stand. So it's kind of cross like oh. but not really. Weird. Hmm. Um, but police also found uh, the bodies of multiple mutilated cats outside the main gates of the school that day. Um, as well as where some other attacks had also occurred. Which we'll get into a bit. Ooh. On June nope. 6th, so uh, about a week later, a letter was sent to the newspaper, the Cody or Kobe Shinbun, and the letter was Ooh. delivered in a brown envelope with no return address or name listed, and it had been postmarked for June 3rd, so that's when it had been sent. 
Okay. And yeah, this is very, very Zodiac. Um, the letter was three pages long and consisted of 1,400 uh, words or characters. Oh my god, that's a whole essay you could turn in. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this letter what sent the to the heck? newspaper contained the confessions of Sakaki Bera uh, for strangling and decapitating Jean and said that more killings would follow. And it too was written in the same red ink and included the six character name pronounced Sakaki Bera, Sato, which individually meant alcohol, devil, rose, saint, and fight. Uh, what? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and so these six characters were also included on the first note. So police probably at this time hadn't made this note public, so they knew this was the same person. Oh, okay. Yes. Very smart yeah. tactic on their part to hold some information back yeah. no i just like i was trying to process that fight it's like what <laughs> it yeah. sounds like drama from your mama <laughs> but yeah okay uh so this letter um i don't have it in its entirety but this is a blurb it said uh or it began with now it's the beginning of a game and the letter stated that, quote, I am putting my life at stake for the sake of this game. If I'm caught, I'll probably be hanged. Police should be angrier and more tenacious in pursuing me. It's only when I kill that I'm liberated from the constant hatred that I suffer and that I'm able to obtain peace. It is only when I give pain to people that I can ease my own pain. And the letter also lashed out against the Japanese educational system, calling it compulsionary education that formed me an invisible person. Oh. Right. Okay. It's oh, just all okay. over the place. <laughs> I know. So were my thoughts when I was hearing this. I'm like, what? Yeah. Interesting. Okay. So, initial reports, because this letter was sent to a newspaper, so of course they're going to publish it. Um, mm. And initial reporting, the Japanese media reported the name as Onibara instead of uh, Sakakibara. Um, okay. At which, yeah, it sounds similar to a uh, term. Yeah. Only bur I don't know exactly what the one I w said was, but yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sounds similar. So this one, um, by itself just meant demons rose. Um, Ooh. and this, because it was written in the newspaper and the killer had given themselves the Sakaki Bera name with six characters, they got pretty mad and they wrote then a three letter or a third letter to the police station um, which stated quote from now on if you misread my name or spoil my mood I'll kill three vegetables a week if you think I <laughs> yeah okay <laughs> he'll kill him he'll eat him right up yeah <laughs> uh, if you think I can only kill children you are greatly mistaken Oh. Um, so that's the only quote they have from the letter that was sent to the police. I'm not sure how much more it had. What the hell? And then somebody ate all the... The, the vegetables. The rutabagas. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so are you... Because right away at just <laughs> the next part of the story jumps into who the killer is. So... Because okay. there isn't really anything in between. Mm. So, uh, <laughs> this is like the shock of the lifetime when I read this and saw who the killer was. I was like, okay, there was no way I wasn't covering this. Because it's just so fucked. Oh. On June 28th, 
police arrested 14-year-old junior high school student on suspicion of murder. So, the kid that committed these crimes was 14. 14-year-old? Yeah. What? Yeah. Uh, shortly after his arrest, okay. um, the boy, he's written... So, because of, like, privacy laws in Japan, um, the kid is normally just called, like, Sakakibara Sato. Um, uh -huh. but in all, like, court proceedings and police files, he's referred to as Boy A. Um, it's pretty okay. common when people underage are involved that they're given, like, Girl A, Girl B, Boy A, Boy B kind of stuff. Okay. Instead In of Japan. using names. Yeah. Mm. Because of privacy when people are underage. Okay. Same way, like, we don't tend to say minors' names. Yeah. In North America, if, like, uh, yeah, or whatever, in the court documents. <clears throat> yeah. Um, so, yeah, 14-year-old junior high school student was arrested on suspicion of murder, and shortly after his arrest, boy A confessed to the murder of Jean, as well as the murder of 10-year-old Ayaka Yamesh Yameshita. And Ooh. she had been killed on March 16th, and mm. he had attacked her with a hammer um, during oh, a no. spree when he attacked three other girls in a similar way within, like, a week of each other. Ugh. That is gruesome. And just an yeah. hour after the attack on Ayaka, a nine-year-old girl was attacked in the same neighborhood, and she sustained several stab wounds. And she Ugh. was rushed to a hospital where she ended up surviving the attack. And oh my god. Yeah, to bring it back around this time, a number of mutilated animals also turned up dead again Ooh, it's like skinwalker ranch yeah. i don't know <laughs> um wow. so after the march 16th attack uh he had written in his or boy a had written in his diary quote i carried out sacred experiments today to confirm how fragile human beings are I brought the hammer down. When the girl turned to face me, I think I hit her a few times, but I was too excited to remember. And... Oh. Yeah. The following yeah. week, on March 23rd, he added to his diary, This morning my mom told me, Poor girl. The girl attacked seems to have died. Uh, it goes on, There's no sign of me being caught. I thank you... Bamio Bamio de Koshin. Um this story that's like a name? Yeah, when you look it up, um so he says like I think that for this please continue to protect me. Mm -hmm. Um when you look it up it actually has no meaning outside of the case. Um some sources say they have absolutely no idea what he's referencing. One source I found said that it's believed that this is an imaginary version of the Buddha, like, head. Um, oh, that has, like, a swastika-like symbol drawn on it. But it really has no meaning outside of this case. Nobody's really confirmed what it means. Wow. Interesting. Mm -hmm. <sighs> um, I don't know. I love a good mystery, even if it baffles me completely. Right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So during his confession, he also told police that he had washed um, John's severed head in his family bath, like in the bathroom, to quote, release his soul. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Um, as I mentioned, because he was a juvenile offender at age 14, he was prosecuted and convicted as boy A, and he was sent to a special medical reformatory for juvenile offenders 
in Fuku, Tokyo in October of 1997, where he was set to receive psychiatric treatment and counseling. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he was transferred to an ordinary reformatory in November of 2001 to learn some, like, social skills, because he didn't have a lot. Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Um, and after this, he returned to the medical reformatory in November of 2002. And his real name has not been officially released to the press because Japanese law prohibits publishing the identification of minors. But in some weekly mm -hmm. magazines, his real name has been reported to be uh, Shini... Shini Choru Azuma. Um, but this is, like, completely unconfirmed. Okay, but wouldn't it be unheard of? Yeah. Like, I can, yeah, I've definitely heard of that, where it's, like, nobody wants to actually say the names of any minors. We don't do that in Canada either, I don't think. Yeah. Yeah, if they're involved in something like that. <clears throat> Weird. Yeah, so... Some information, like, about the killer here. Um, so, Sakakibara, or Boy A, um, his use of the term, quote, vegetables in the one note, um, reportedly refers to the people around him, and it's reported he learned this term from his parents, who had once told him, quote, if you're nervous at your athletic meet, people, or er, picture the people around you as vegetables. What? Oh. I guess it means, okay. like, they're not a threat? I don't know. It's like the whole in their underwear thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Weird. Um, okay. <laughs> a, uh, one source I had said that the personality profile of Boy A is seen to be a classic case of Hakiki Omori syndrome. Oh. Um yeah, this I'd never heard of, but it's quite specific. No. Uh, it's a Japanese word that describes a condition that mainly affects adolescents or young adults who live isolated from the world. They live cloistered with their parents, or cloistered within their parents' homes. They're often locked in their bedrooms for days, months, or even years on end, and even refuse to communicate with their family to some degree. Wow. Very cult-like, if I do say so myself. Yeah. Interesting. Isolated from everybody else. Yeah, that's why mm. I assume he was sent to receive, like, social skills. Because he didn't have oh. a whole lot. Um, in an analysis of the case, journalist Gamal Nekroma wrote the worst thing about the case is that one might have seen it coming yet neither his family nor japan seem or nor japan heeded the telltale signs japanese children are confronted with an extremely difficult examination at the tender age of six their performance effectively determines their whole future for it decides whether they'll go to a good elementary school or one of the despised state schools. Parents, Ooh. yeah. Uh, Shade. <laughs> yeah. Uh, parents have no faith in the state system, and Sakaki Bera's mother was no exception. She pressured her firstborn son to firstborn to excel at school, even though social workers warned her that her son was mentally unstable. Oh. Well. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, this <laughs> one I don't know. I think but... she did the best she could, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. Everything about this kid just reminds me 100% Ed Kemper. Like, just everything. Mm. Um. Oh, well... At least I would say, as a mother, I feel like she was a better mother. I'm not hearing any of the horrible oh, yeah. things that, yeah, that Ed Kemper's mother said to him. 
Not, yeah. Not quite as horrible. Any- yeah, so... I mean, that, I guess that's an improvement. <laughs> yeah. Um, but still. So it's reported he had... Or he was already torturing and killing young animals as, as a hobby when he was fairly mm. young. And soon after, he had become... Or he had began physically attacking girls as he walked, like, on his way to school. He... oh Yeah. Uh, he was set on a violent path, violent path from the beginning, mm. and he began carrying, like, cutting weapons or sharp weapons while still in elementary school. Oh, no. Yeah. That's... I mean, you don't have to use those. It's not necessary. Yeah. <laughs> Poor guy. Um. I wonder what he grew up around, I guess. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, hmm. uh, he wrote in his diary, quote, I can ease my irritation when I'm holding a survival knife or spinning scissors like a pistol. Oh. Who doesn't love to good. spin scissors like a pistol, so, um. <laughs> <laughs> I saw something earlier today that was, like, things that were, tr- you know, I'm sure it was something to do with trying to be marketed that weren't great, and it was, like, these were scented scissors, like, oh, God. oh, yeah, totally, you want your children to, like, take these, even if they're blunt-ended scissors, yeah, and Pulls just them smell right them because they face. smell like strawberries, yeah. <laughs> You're like, how, why, okay, <laughs> great. <laughs> mm-hmm. Uh, so at the age of 12, he was exhibiting extreme cruelty to animals, and he reportedly, I don't know if this was once or multiple times, he was lining up rows of frogs in a street and then riding over them with his bicycle. Oh, no. Yeah, as well as, like, mutilating dozens and dozens of cats and decapitating, like, pigeons and birds. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay, maybe not your normal boy's curiosity as to which yeah. animal wins in a fight. He's just, like, kind of killing them all? <laughs> yeah. Wow. Um, okay. According to those that knew him, he made friends easily, but was known to be quite strange. He was pretty open about his interests, and he told friends that his hobbies included collecting cats' eyeballs and tongues. I mean, no, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> Don't like that one bit. No. Oh. Uh, according to, this just says, according to the Kobe child killer, he was inspired <laughs> to write the letter to police after reading about the Zodiac killer. Some pretty heavy oh. reading for under 14. And... At his Mm -hmm. home, police discovered books about, like, Hitler and Nazis, as well as books about serial killers. Oh, wow. Uh, even worse, uh, a search of his bedroom showed up thousands of, like, the manga volumes and, uh, pornographic videos and anime and it was enough that the Japanese politician, uh, Shizuka Kami, called for restricting ob- objectional content, stating, movies lacking any literary or educational merit made for just showing <laughs> cruel scenes. Adults should be blamed for this, and that the incident gives adults the chance to rethink the policy of self-imposed restrictions on these films and whether they should allow them just because they're profitable. Oh my god. Yeah, obviously not profitable to him. No. Because that was what the Japanese minister allegedly, don't cancel us. Um, A politician, (laughs) yeah. Oh my good lord. Um, on the other side, and I, based on, like, his diary entries, I don't really go along with this, but who knows? I mean, there's so much that we probably don't know about this case because he was underage. 
Mm. But some that knew the boy, um, such as his principal at school, and even, it said a lawyer, but I, it was a lawyer that had worked on, um, like, false conviction cases. So I don't know if he had ever worked okay. with the boy or if he had just read about it. Hmm. Um, okay. But they agree that some of the evidence doesn't point to him. Um, police investigators said that one of the murders was made by a left-handed person. And boy <laughs> A is right-handed. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. That one just seems so flimsy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, boy A's confession is said it contained many absurd statements and claims of things that would be impossible for a 14-year-old to do. Okay. Um, and boy A had bad grades, like he was pretty bad in school, and yet his confession and these, like, letters sent to the police, even though they were cryptic, they contained many elaborate figures of speech and, like, similes and were quite well written, at least the translated to English versions. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay, yeah. then. Well, he's not so delusional. Yeah. Silly? <laughs> um, okay. But in, yeah, so that, I wanted to mention that because there is that side to it as well that he's possibly wrongly convicted. I, however, don't think that way. And when he was visited by his mother while he was in prison or this reformatory school, she had asked him, like, point blank if he had really committed both of these crimes, and he confirmed to mm -hmm. her that he had. Okay. Um, as part of this case, along with a couple others, uh, in 2000, Japan's by Camiral legislature actually lowered the age of criminal responsibility from age 16 to 14. Oh. Yeah, shortly after this case. But since then, there's been cases involving killers as young as 11 who have even put the age being set to 14 as, like, questionable in Japan, I guess. Oh, really? That's weird, hey? Yeah. Which is kind of worrisome, but... I mean... Uh... My next sentence is part of what horrified me in this whole thing. So imagine this kid did decapitate somebody, mutilate their body, put it in front of the school, bludgeoned, like, attacked four girls, killed one of them with a hammer, mutilated all these cats, um, so in 2004, Boy A was released on provisional basis, having only been in a reformatory school, or a reformatory for six years. He was released at age 21. Oh and, my god. Yeah. Was this in Derry? No. Sorry. <laughs> right? Like, this horrifies me that this person was only, like... Yeah... Only six Weird. years. Um, there was a full release announced uh, to follow, set for January 1st of 2005. And the parole board stated that he had been fully, 100% rehabilitated to what they believed a sufficient level from the treatment and education programs he had been put through. Mm hmm and the murders and subsequent release of Boy A gained widespread attention from media as well as politicians. Um, because of the nature of the crimes, they, like, announced his release, even though they didn't give his name. Okay. Yeah. They um, might not have had it. <laughs> yeah, due to the seriousness of the crimes and the fact that they had been committed by a minor, his name... His residence um, had been, like, a heavily guarded secret at the time. Um, interesting enough, though, the parents of Jan Hayes and Ayaka, his victims, actually don't wish him any bad feelings. 
Um, they both really hope he has been rehabilitated, even though it was such a short amount of time. And they really hope that he doesn't forget his victims and the lives he took. But they didn't seem to be angry or mad, which was oh my god, kind of interesting. Really? Yeah. That's weird. Yeah, because they don't really have any motives on why he did any of this. Um, like, could have been like a targeted attack or something. They have no idea. Mm -hmm. um, uh, sources close to the case said that uh, Boy A had written no had read notes written by the victim's families and had said that he would like to find a job in a way to make money to pay them like some sort of financial compensation. And the sources quoted him as saying that he would not forget the severity of his crimes and would like to spend his life making up for them. Uh, I mean, you still took their lives. Yeah, uh, okay. Boy, Weirdo. Yeah, Boy mm -hmm. A's mother released a statement through her lawyer saying, quote, Our son is now doing his best to have courage to plunge into the world of anxieties and uncertainties. I believe there will be a long and tough road ahead for us and our son, but if possible, I hope the public will watch over us quietly. Aww. Um, the lawyer who served Boy A's, or served as Boy A's counselor during the juvenile trial cautioned, quote, if people around him make a big fuss and put him on the spot, it would make it difficult for him to reintegrate into society. And by realizing the value of his own life, he now feels he wants to make up for having taken people's lives. He has grown up a lot in a short period of time, and I'm not worried. Wow. I mean, I'm worried because you released him at age 21. That's still, like, your brain still proven isn't fully developed at that point. So, I mean. That is true. true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It could have been a few more years there. I'd feel a bit better. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And this is why. Because in, this is why I feel very, not even just the decapitation uh, I had mentioned how he talks about the crimes, not even his, like, diary entries he made when he was 14. But just kind of how he's handled it since he's been out of, like, I guess the reformatory period. So, oh. in June of 2015, uh, Sakaki Bera, who was a uh, age 32 at the time, released an autobiography through a publishing company, uh, and it was titled Zika, uh, in oh. which he claimed to express regret for his crimes, and then went on to recount the murders in very vivid graphic detail. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, despite attempts by John Hayes's family to block the release of the book, and despite even one bookstore chain refusing to stock and sell the book, it unfortunately quickly reached the top of Japanese bestseller lists, and the book sold out its entire 100,000 initial run in just three weeks, earning the Kobe oh, Child wow. Killer an estimated $93,000, I assume US. Wow. Um, Either way, it's a lot. Yeah. Uh, I believe this is from the book. Uh, it says, quote, Let me confess something. I thought the sight was a beauty. He wrote, referring to displaying John's head in public view. He also confessed that before displaying the head, he had taken it to the bathroom in his home, where he had washed it and committed a deed, quote, far more heinous than murder. Ugh. Very Edmund Kemper. What the fuck? Uh, according yeah. to the Kobe child killer, while a teenager, he was an, quote, incorrigible sexual deviant. 
who took satisfaction in mutilating animals before eventually moving on to killing human beings. And I think this is also from his book. It says, quote, When I advanced to junior high school, I had already become bored of killing cats and gradually found myself fantasizing about how it would feel to murder human beings like me. Okay. <laughs> yeah, this is why I'm like, Oh, uh, he's just a slime ball. I don't like him. Mm -hmm. uh, so Kakibara set up a vanity website um, that had like a little bio information about him that listed things such as his height, weight, and in it stated that he was suffering from expansive delusions. I don't have any information okay. more on that. But in some of the pictures he posted in a gallery section, there were photographs of a nude man wearing a mask. Um, one of my sources said it was, like, described as poorly photoshopped nude bodies that people assumed were supposed to be him, but they were photoshopped. Mm. And in response to the controversies about the book as well as the website, the tabloid Shakan Post, they're actually the ones that publicize Sakaki Bear's real name as uh, Shinitro Azuma, and they actually listed both, it, along with his name, his occupation and where he was living. Oh, wow. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I have. That's the the Kobe child killer. <laughs> oh and my it's, god. It's crazy. That's crazy. Yeah, it's just I was reading it and I was like, "Oh my god." And then I was like, "They arrested a 14-year-old." And then I was reading these quotes and I was like, "Oh my god, this kid's like so messed up." Oh yeah. <laughs> like yeah. Ugh. I can't believe I didn't know about it. Yeah, it's insane. Wow. Yeah. Good job finding that somehow. Yeah, I can't <laughs> remember how I stumbled on it, but he has, like, a page on, like, Murderpedia. That was one of my sources. Okay. But, yeah, very wow. sad for the victims and everything for what happened. They didn't deserve that, and... As far mm -hmm. as I could tell, like, maybe it's privacy laws. They don't mention much about, like, his home life. Maybe something was going on there. But Could be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we just don't really know. Right. Wow, good job, mm -hmm. though. Thanks, you really too. Really entertaining. <laughs> yeah, it was crazy. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. Well, until well, next time, we'll catch you on some scary ships. <laughs> yes. Yes, that should be interesting. Stay right. cryptic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks for listening. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs>